Hi there! Sometimes we have the need of creating different signal shapes that work in perfect sync with each other. Although it is possible to sync different oscillators to obtain such a result, it is sometimes preferable to generate a single signal and then modify its shape to obtain the other required shapes. It is easy, for example, to create a square wave starting from any other shape, simply by using a Schmidt trigger, which we have seen in previous videos. But things get more complicated when we want to change another shape into a sinusoidal shape, especially if we want to achieve such objective on a larger range of frequencies. Fortunately, there is a whole category of devices that can help on that, and they are in fact called wave shapers. Today, we will concentrate on a particular shaper, one that can convert a triangular wave into a sine wave. Let's get into it. The first thing that comes into mind to create a sine wave shaper is to use a low-pass filter. In fact, we know that a generic shape is obtained by adding up several sine waves at different frequencies and amplitudes, where the frequencies are multiple of a base frequency sine wave, which has the same frequency of our generic shape. And so, to extract a sine wave from a triangular wave, we just need to filter out all the waves at a frequency higher than the base one, leaving there for only the base sine wave. The simplest approach is a first-order low-pass filter, like the one in this picture. If we input a complex signal above the cutoff frequency of this filter, all the highest harmonics of the signal will be attenuated by the filter, and therefore we will obtain a signal very close to a sine wave at the output. The cutoff frequency of such a filter is given by this simple equation, fc equals 1 over 2 pi rc. From here, we can express the RC product as a function of the cutoff frequency, like this, and if we set a specific value for the cutoff frequency and the capacitor, we can calculate the value of the resistor. But how good is this circuit to shape the triangular wave into a sine wave? Let's check that out in the lab. So this is the 33K resistor, and this is the 4.7 nanofarad capacitor, and together they form the filter we just calculated. The input is between these two points, and the output is between these other two points. The common part is the reference point or ground connection. We will use these pins as the ground, these for the input, and these for the output. I have also connected a function generator to the input of the filter, which is currently providing a triangular wave at 10 kHz, 10 times higher than the filter cutoff frequency. The output is instead connected to the first channel of the oscilloscope, visible on the screen in yellow. The blue signal is the one coming from the function generator, and added to the input of the filter, so that we can watch both signals at the same time. And you can see that the output of the filter is a pretty nice sine wave. Note, however, how the amplitude of the input signal has a value of 5 volts, but the sine wave at the output of the filter is just about 400 mV, which is over 10 times smaller than the input itself. Let's see now what happens if we increase the input frequency. In theory, increasing the frequency, more harmonics should be removed from the triangular wave, and the sine wave should be shaped better and better. And look, the shape gets better, but its amplitude becomes smaller and smaller. In fact, at the current 25 kHz, the amplitude is now only 200 mV. So, this kind of shaper does not work very well when we increase the frequency, because although the shape is good, the amplitude tends to become smaller and smaller, until it will become negligible if we keep increasing the frequency. Let's try now with smaller frequencies. And you see that while the frequency decreases, the amplitude starts to increase. Now we are back at the original 10 kHz, and now we go further down to see what happens at lower frequencies. 
Now we are around the 6 kHz, and we can see that while the shape is still good, the amplitude has increased dramatically. Going down now to 4 kHz and changing the scale, since now the amplitude is much bigger. But now you can see that the shape has become distorted, and going down even further with the frequency the distortion keeps increasing. And now we are at 1 kHz, which is exactly the cutoff frequency of the filter. And you see the shape of the sine wave is definitely distorted now. Look in particular at the difference between the right side of the wave and the left side. If we now go below that frequency, the amplitude of the output keeps increasing, while the shape becomes closer and closer to the triangular wave at the input. So basically, using an input signal with a frequency above the cutoff frequency of the filter, we obtain a good shape of the sine wave, but with a smaller and smaller amplitude. Vice versa, with a frequency below the cutoff frequency, the output shape becomes closer and closer to the triangular wave at the input, and the amplitude becomes closer and closer to the amplitude at the input. We can therefore deduct that a low-pass filter is a relatively ok shaper if it has to work at specific frequencies above the cutoff frequency. But as soon as we increase or decrease the frequency, things get quickly worse, either because of the amplitude or because of the shape. And so if we need a sine wave shaper that works on a wide range of frequencies, we have to explore a different solution. The solution that I am now proposing is this much more complex circuit that takes advantage of the non-linearity of the diode's characteristic. To understand how this circuit works, we need to examine its parts a little bit at a time. Let's start with the resistors on the top and the bottom lines. You may have noticed already that these resistors are all connected in series, and they are connected to a dual power supply that provides plus and minus 2.4 volt. These resistors are basically a voltage divider which creates different voltages at each node of the resistor's series. Considering the power supply voltage and the value of the resistors, we can calculate the voltage at each node of the chain. And then we can write down these values on the original schematic. Note that I can do this because if there is no input, all the diodes are inversely polarized, and so they all work as open circuits, and therefore we can disregard them all along with the resistors in the center row. Let's ask ourselves a question now. What kind of voltage should we apply to the input so that the diodes become directly polarized and start conducting a current? Let's start with the node between D1 and D2. In order for D1 to be directly polarized, we need to apply at the node a voltage that is at least 0.73 volt plus the forward voltage of the diode. The forward voltage of a 1N4148 is about 0.6 volt, and so in order to directly polarize D1, we need a voltage on its anode of at least 1.33 volt. Similarly, to directly polarize D2, we would need a voltage of at least minus 1.33 volts. And repeating the same reasoning for all the other diodes, we obtain all the other voltages that I have written at those central nodes. You can understand now why I said that if there is no voltage at the input, all the diodes are inversely polarized, and therefore they are all open circuits. Let's now go one step further, and for that, let's take a look at the forward characteristic of a single diode. Can you see that in reality we can have a very small current even if we are below the forward voltage? It is very small, but it is there, and such current increases exponentially with the voltage applied to the diode. Then. Finally, when we reach the forward voltage, the current becomes limited only by the resistor in series with the diode. Can you see that the shape of the characteristic below the forward voltage resembles a piece of a sine wave? And that is why the circuit is able to convert a triangular shape into a sinusoidal shape. Basically, when there is no input, there is no output, of course. 
but when the input becomes slightly positive, the output becomes slightly positive as well. After a while, the output amplitude will increase more slowly than the input, and that's because the diode D1 will start shunting some current toward the ground, and we will have a voltage drop on R13, and so on the output. If we keep increasing the input voltage following the amplitude of the triangular shape, we will reach the point that D3 will be directly polarized, and the amplitude of the output will increase even less. And then the same will happen when the amplitude continues to increase, directly polarizing one after another also D5, D7, D9 and D11. Once we reach D11 in particular, since that diode does not have a serious resistor, the output voltage will not be able to increase anymore, and will remain set to plus 3 volts, even though the triangular wave continue increasing up to 5 volts. Now, if we consider the negative part of the triangular wave, all we have said about the upper diodes will apply to the lower diodes, in the same way, cutting further and further the negative output until it reaches minus 3 volt. So, you see what's happening? Let's look at it from another perspective. In this picture, the red triangular shape is the input voltage. All those horizontal lines are the voltages at which the various diodes become directly polarized. The blue shape is the actual output forced in that shape by the forward currents of the diodes once they become directly polarized. Can you see how the output is forced in a sinusoidal shape by all those diodes? Well, you could tell me now, that's very simplistic, it's not going to work, there is no way that the circuit can behave like that. Well, ok, let's build such a circuit and test it in lab, like we did it for the low pass filter, and see what happened. However, since this is very confusing to build, I decided to use fritzing to obtain the layout of the breadboard, so I wouldn't make any mistake. You can use this picture too to build the circuit by yourself and test it, if you like. And here is the circuit already mounted on the breadboard. On this side you can see the line of resistors on the upper part of the schematic. These instead are the resistors on the bottom side of the schematic. And these, in the center, are all the resistors on the center line of the schematic. Alongside these resistors you can also see the diodes, which are the most important part of the shaper circuit. This pin header on the left is the device input, and this one on the right is the device output. This black wire is positioned between the two 100 ohm resistors, and so it is the one defining the ground of the circuit. In series to the input you see these two resistors of 100 ohm each. I should have put here a single 200 ohm resistor, but since I didn't have it, I used the two 100 ohm resistors in series. Let me now spend a couple of minutes to make all the connections with the generator, the oscilloscope and the power supply, then I will be back to you to demonstrate how the circuit works. And I am back, with all the connections already established. Here is the oscilloscope probe to examine the output of the circuit. And the input here is connected to the function generator, currently set to produce a triangular wave with 10 volt peak to peak or plus minus 5 volt. The frequency is currently set to 10 Hz. Here instead is the power supply, currently set to provide 4.8 V, which corresponds to the plus minus 2.4 V. The power supply, however, is single voltage, so I had to split the voltage in the plus and minus 2.4 V. The split is done inside the saltoid tin. The input on the back side is connected to the power supply, and the output has three banana plugs, one for the ground, one for the minus 2.4 volt, and one for the plus 2.4 volt. And this is the inside circuit, which is basically made with some capacitors and resistors to split the voltage and stabilize it. The way it is made, this splitter is able to provide a clean voltage split, as long as the current does not exceed about 100 mA and the load is balanced at plus minus 10%. I won't talk any further about this splitter, however if you are interested let me know in the comments and I will provide a video on it if there is a reasonable amount of requests. Let's now take a look at the oscilloscope to see what is going on in this circuit. 
So, the Bluetooth Ace shows the input applied to the device, which comes directly from the function generator, like in the previous example. The output instead is connected to the other channel, visible here in yellow. And you can see that the output signal is very closely resembling the sine wave that we are looking for. The signal is actually still a little pointy over here, but that depends on the resistor we put in series with the input, which currently has a value of 200 ohm. Modifying this value, we can tune the sine wave shape until we obtain a nice looking sinusoidal signal. As an example, let me add another resistor in series with the input, and I'm going to use a value of 680 ohm, so that we have a total of 880 ohms in series with the input. And here is the effect on the output signal, which is now much more rounded. In real applications, you would put a trim pot instead of these two resistors, so you could adjust the shape of the output much better than what I am doing now. Another thing that can be done to this circuit to make an even more precise sinusoidal signal would be to increase the stages made with the diodes so that we can adjust the voltages along the shape more precisely. Now, besides these details that are meant just to make the shape look better and better, I would like to show you what happens on such circuit when we start to change the frequency of the input signal. Let's start by increasing the frequency from 10 Hz to 100 Hz. Let's now take a look at the oscilloscope and let's adjust the time scale for a better viewing. And here the shape is identical to the previous case. Let's now increase the frequency even more, to 1 kHz. Let's adjust the timing, and the shape is still the same. Let's now go to 10 kHz, and the shape again is still the same. And now at 100 kHz, and still the same shape, which confirms what we previously said, that this circuit behavior does not change even on a very wide range of frequencies. And moreover, the amplitude of the output signal remains constant. So, it is evident that this kind of shape of circuits are very efficient in changing the shape of the applied signal, while at the same time maintaining the same grade of precision of the shape and the same output signal amplitude when the frequency of the input signal changes, even on a very wide range. And in fact, we have tested this circuit between 10 Hz and 100 kHz, and the behavior remained the same. I hope you found this video both interesting and useful, please let me know in the comments what you think about it. And because we are at that moment of the video, I'll quickly remind you to subscribe to the channel and to enable the notifications, if you haven't done so already, so you won't miss any future episode. I'll see you in the next video, and in the meantime, happy experiments!